This is Evolutionary Radio. This is your host, Trevor Kuritsen. I'm going to start off today's show by making a public apology to Nathan DeAsha. Nathan, I'm sorry, man. I totally screwed up in the Matt Jansen interview. I confused you with Lionel Bayaki. I don't know what was going on in my head. It was just a long day. So I'm sorry. Hopefully, you can accept my apology. If you don't want to come on the show, I totally understand. I just want to say I'm sorry. It was totally my bad. I'm totally at fault here. Joining us today is a seasoned pro. He's been a pro for 14 years. He's someone I really look up to. Welcome to the show, IFBB Pro, Mark Dugdale. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate it. So, Mark, the reason I want to get you on is you do everything. I mean, you're a family man, you're a businessman, you're a husband, you're a father, you're a man of God. I mean, you've been a pro for 14 years. Pretty remarkable, man. How, how, how do you manage to do it all? <laughs> That's the question I always get. Um, and honestly, I don't know. Um, my life's chaotic, but it's just a matter of, I guess, setting priorities and not getting drawn into the weeds, you know, staying on the path, um, putting, putting my faith first and my family second, my business after that and bodybuilding somewhere down the list. Um, but I've got a great wife and she's been very supportive. She's my business partner as well. And so, we pretty much do everything together and um, it's definitely not, I'm not a one man show. Tell us a little bit about you, Mark. Um, I don't follow bodybuilding like Trevor. Trevor's like obsessed with it. I'm honestly, I'm not obsessed about anything, maybe football a little bit, but um, so tell our listeners out there who may not follow bodybuilding as close as Trevor, a little bit about yourself. Um, You know, what got you into bodybuilding and what have you accomplished? Sure. Um, I competed for the first time when I was 18, uh, 1993. Um, I guess going way back, soccer was my thing in high school, but I played football because that's where the glory is in in the States. And so I played football and screwed up my ankle. And so then I couldn't play soccer anymore. And so I ended up in the gym lifting weights. and again, ended up getting convinced to compete in a contest when I was 18 and uh, did the teenage natural in Oregon and won that. And so was hooked and then just continued to compete um, in a lot of amateur shows. My, my wife, um, her and I got married and I thought, well, bodybuilding will be over because she's going to have have our first daughter. And so, um, I went and did the USA cause I was qualified. Um, honestly, I don't even remember the year. Um, but thinking that, well, I'll go do nationals, not like I'm going to win, but it'll be my, it'll be my last competition. Um, I didn't win. I did the middleweight. I don't, I think I got 11th place or something. And, um, it ended up though that I still kept lifting weights, kept competing um, 2003, I, you know, I'd done nationals in the USA a few times and in 2003 went to the USA basically thinking this will be my last shot. I've never made the top five. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll either win it or I'll, I'll retire. Um, I got third behind Chris Dim and Richard Jones, Richard won the overall. And so my wife was like, Oh, you got to go back next year. Um, next year will be your year. Cause Chris Tim went on to, uh, win nationals that same year. So I went back in 04, won the overall. Um, that's back when the, they only gave out two pro cards at the USA. And, um, being a pro is never like my, my goal. You know, you talk to some pro bodybuilders and they're like, I wanted to be a pro from the time I was, you know, 15 years old, that really wasn't the case. I never thought I could turn pro to be honest. Um, so that was, that was a highlight. And then I guess you could say that was sort of a highlight for a good number of years after that, because, um, I didn't win another contest until I think it was around my 30th IFBB pro contest some 10 years later. Um, even though, you know, the sports changed so much, even from when I, you know, I signed with Weeder 
the weekend that I won the USA, you know, went to California, started doing photo shoots, you know, the magazines was the big thing. And there was just, you know, to be an IFBB pro meant something. There wasn't a lot of them out there and there was really only, you know, bodybuilding one division, um, for men. And so, um, whoever was in the publications got the supplement deals and, and everything else. Um, and of course they made us look like we were somebody famous and really we weren't, we were just normal guys, you know, that worked out and had, had decent genetics. Um, but then over the course of, you know, even the last 10 years, things changed a lot. Publications all went away. Uh, contracts kind of went away for a lot of people. Um, and then they just started adding division upon division upon division and handing out, you know, a lot of pro cards to the point that now there's, you know, there's the guys that are IFBB pros and I'm, honestly, I, I don't even know who they are. Um, I mean, it's a that must, that must kind of piss you off because you had to work your ass off for 10 years and then now they're just handing it out like, like candy. Um, I mean, I'm a business owner, so I get it. it. It's an economics thing. The more people they have, the more, um, uh, what is it? Um, pro cards you got, you know, there's a fee associated with your marketing pro or people tagging IFPB and, and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's just changed. I mean, what, what am I going to do? Whine about it? You know? So I just kind of, kind of roll with it. I mean, it is what it is. Mark, I think a lot of people on the outside kind of look at you and they think he's got the perfect life. You know, he doesn't have any problems. You know, he's got a good job. He's got a good wife. He's got the perfect family, but you go through struggles just like everyone else. And in fact, you're going through some really serious family troubles right now. So talk to us a little bit about that and, and show our listeners, you know, you're a real person just like everyone else. You know, you get your groceries at Costco just like we do. You know, you go through hardships with your kids. You probably get in fights with your wife. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, Trevor, the last eight months have probably been the hardest eight months of my life. Um, I was about a week out from starting my diet, if you will, for competing. I was going to probably do the Vancouver BC pro, maybe the, the Dallas Europa, um, this last spring, early summer. Um, and ended up, um, my business just had, there's just too much going on. Um, I had a partner up until September of 2017 and, uh, signed a contract to buy him out. And so he was 68 years old, I think, uh, retiring. And so we kind of had a different philosophy. Um, and we, we employ over 80 employees, um, and have been in business since 1987. So to change the culture of a business, um, you know, I thought, well, now I'm hundred percent owner, this will be easy. I'm going to just change the culture and, it doesn't work that way. Um, there's been a lot of turnover and a lot of um, changes that I've had to do here at my business. Um, and it's just sucked a lot of time. And so, you know, in January, um, just as I was about to start contemplating competing, um, my wife came to me and just said, you're insane. Like if you compete, something's gonna break you know, the business, our relationship, I don't know what. And, um, and so I reluctantly, because I kind of had my, my mind set on competing, um, agreed with her. And, um, so I, I elected not to, not to compete this last spring. And then, um, I wouldn't say my business got any easier. Um, it, it took a lot more of her time, my time, um, my business, we're being sued class action lawsuit, um, which is highly stressful. Uh, we've been fighting it for a year and a half. Um, and so that's, that's been difficult because just trying to run a business on its own is hard enough, let alone, uh, deal with lawyers. Um, and so then in the midst of all of that, um, my youngest daughter, it was her first year in high school this last year. And, um, anybody that's followed my, 
my bodybuilding career knows, yeah, that I'm, I'm a one man or I'm a one woman man. And, um, I've got three daughters and, and we've poured a lot into them. Um, and you know, you, you raise your, your kids a certain way when they're young, you think, um, I guess I was naive to think that you do it all. You try and do everything right when they're young and they're going to become teenagers and not make all the, the stupid mistakes that you made. Um, because I made all of them and, and I was the boy that, that I, that I loathe right now when they come around my daughters. Um, and so my youngest had a really rough year. The last six months was really hard. Um, I don't want to go into a ton of details, but, um, she ended up in, in the hospital for a few days. Um, and, um, I'm just grateful that she's breathing and I'm grateful that, um, since then, um, she got into some good community of people, um, and has really turned things around. Um, the school year is about to start again. So I'm a little nervous, um, you know, putting her back into that environment. Um, but it's a challenge, you know, cause as a dad, I can't control everything. You know, I want to, I want to be the protector. I want to, I want to control and make sure that they're safe and, um, they've got to make their own choices. Um, you can't, you can't put them in a box, you know, they have to grow up. They have to slowly move away from being in your protection and make those decisions. And unfortunately there's people that, um, that can pull them into areas that they shouldn't be in. Um, but ultimately they have to make that decision for themselves. And so, um, I'm, I'm grateful that, that, that she's turned, turned it around. Um, and really it's just a testament to our church community, um, gathering around her and, um, and the community that she's in now. And I'll say that that goes for any, for anybody, including myself. Um, there's no lone Rangers, um, that are, that are walking intimately in faith. Um, it's always done as a group. Um, I've got guys in my life that, that I can lean on or they can jerk my chain if, if I'm out of line and they have license to do that. And teenagers need that as well. They need good influences and they need good people, um, pointing them in the right direction. Well, I'll say this, I have a family friend and she uh, has three teenage daughters and Two of them are doing great. One went down the wrong path. And um, I was talking to her about it and I was kind of joking with her about having kids because I was like, oh, having kids is easy. I was kind of just messing with her. And she told me, she's like, you know what? It is easy until they become teenagers. Then that's the hard part. She's like, when they're babies, that's the easy part. And I'm like, really? That's the easy part? You're screaming at night, keeping you up, you have to change diapers. She's like, yeah, trust me, that's the easy part. So when they become teenagers, yeah. But I had uh, my stepson as well. He got into um, heroin. Mm. And uh, he got into the wrong crowd and all that stuff too. So it's so easy for them to fall into that uh, wrong crowd and, and get into that. So, But I will say I'm not a, uh, you know, Trevor's a big church guy. You're a big church guy. I'm not. I'm not in, um, into organized religion. But I will say the good thing about – you know, um, organized religion in a good group, it's a group setting and that can really be there for you in, in a downtime. And there's a lot of people out there in pain and to have that kind of security, you know, of going to your church and having people rally around you is, is, is really a good thing to have. So that, that's one of the advantages of, of being in that situation. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. How have they helped you? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying I'm actually not big into organized religion myself. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, early on the followers of Jesus Christ uh, were referred to as the followers of the way. And the reason they were called or, you know, given that name is because they, their life actually looked like his, they were the followers of his way. They followed, you know, their life looked like his, and now we have a nation full of Christians whose lives look nothing like Jesus Christ. And so um, 
I don't, I don't really like organized religion because it's usually man-made rules. Um, and, and it strays from the person and the work of Jesus. And so, um, I'm more into the gospel and what Jesus says, not so much what organized religion has to say. Um, because if you look at his life, you know, he wasn't going around accusing people and shaming people and guilting people into obedience. He was loving people into, into wanting to follow him. Um, and that just simply isn't, unfortunately, the way of, of a lot of organized religions. Um, so, I mean, that said, yeah, I'm still involved in, in a church community and I still have guys um, that share my worldview um, that I meet with that, that don't necessarily attend my church. Um, and we help hold each other accountable, but you know, we're all, there ain't nobody perfect out there except the man himself that I claim to follow Jesus Christ. And so, um, even, even in, in churches, it's tough because it's like people go into church and think it's safe because, well, they're Christians, but it, it doesn't always mean it's safe, you know? And unfortunately, um, that's just, the way it is. We're all, we're all a little jacked up. We're all, we all got baggage that we're carrying and we all have a tendency to be selfish. And so um, even the best, best laid churches that, that claim to follow Jesus, they don't always uh, do that. Um, and so that's where grace has to come in. You gotta, you gotta be able to forgive people. Um, obviously within reason. Um, but but that's really what it's about for me. It's not so much um, a building. Um, it's, it's a relationship, if you will. Mark, talk to us a little bit about stress. I mean, I don't have any kids. I couldn't even imagine what you're going through right now. Just like, it seems like the Hail Mary is thrown at you. How are you able to deal with it all and, you know, still function day to day? Um, Good question. I mean, I guess I would say probably three things. One, um, the iron. <laughs> I go take it out on the on the iron. I go work out. Um, that's my release. You know, some people <clears throat> disconnect, binge watching net Netflix or you know, or having a beer or whatever. But for me, um, I go to the gym. Uh, that helps keep me sane. Um, secondarily, the guys that I'm friends with, um, that I am in community with, um, and, and then third is just literally praying. Um, I'm not a big, I've never, you know, throughout my life really been a big prayer guy, but, um, God's taught me this last year that I, I'm operating, uh, beyond my pay grade, trying to raise teenage daughters and I need his help, um, and I shouldn't say just in that regard. I mean, even in business, um, I've, I've been, I've been trying to, because I think he's systematically trying to get me to move myself out of the way, um, and to trust him. Um, I say that God's a good God. Um, and he's, um, he's been making sure that that isn't just lip service that I say, because it's the right thing to say. Um, I'm having to trust him when I don't see where the, where the end is, where I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, um, where I see my kids, you know, um, in bad situations and I can't, um, I can't necessarily rescue them. And so, um, I'm praying for a lot of intervention often. So, so Mark, you live in, um, near Seattle, correct? Yeah. Um, where did you, where were you born and where'd you grow up? Town called uh, Bothell, which is 15 minutes outside of Seattle. Okay. So what's and it like living there? Cause you're the first guest we've had in the Seattle area. We, most of the people on here are South, South California, uh, Florida, you know, you're the first guy we've had from Seattle. Tell us a little bit about Seattle. Is it very outdoorsy? Is it, um, I know it rains every day. <laughs> that's, just, that's, that's what everyone thinks. That, yeah, that's, the, that's what everybody says to keep Californians away. Um, it, it does probably rain a fair amount in the winter, um, but 
if you're into the outdoors, yes, you can be, you, you can be it's in salt water in 20 minutes, or you can be in the mountains in the winter, at least skiing, which I love to do um, in an hour and 15 minutes. Um, east of the Cascades, it's usually hot and dry, um, almost a desert environment. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do outdoors. Um, presently, everybody's high because pot's legal. Um, and um, it's weird. <laughs> there's like pot shops everywhere. Like when I was in high school, you had to, you know, sneak and get that. Now it's like everybody's just doing it. Um, although I don't think it's actually been helpful making it legal. I'm, I tend to be more of a libertarian and think, you know, everything should be legal. But um, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more drug use, I think, uh, with younger kids because pot is legal. So I don't know. I'm not so sure how I feel about that. Well, the younger kids are on every other prescription drug too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like if they're, if they're trading that for pot, it's probably, you know, better, yeah. you know, Yeah. in, in my yeah. view, because it's like every day we have someone post on the forums, they're on Adderall or an ADHD medication. They're on this, they're on that. I'm like, dude, like, I mean, really like, come on. It's like, my, I don't know. Mark, uh, you're, you're one of the few bodybuilders who's not a personal trainer, so you don't really know this firsthand, but I train people for a living. And one of the questions I have is like, give me a list of your current medications because I want to make sure, you know, nothing is going to interfere or anything like that. I would say the average person aged 18 to 25 is on five or six different medications. Wow. They're on like three different um, depressants. They're on like, Alzheimer's drugs and the problem is is they hear from the buddy like hey take Adderall to help you focus when you're studying they go to their doctor and the doctor's like sure here's a prescription yeah because they're incented to sell drugs the biggest pushers of drugs are doctors really it's true and the sad thing is you know you have someone who's 20 they go to their doctor and they're like hey you know I'm feeling a little bit depressed instead of that doctor saying like well you know maybe take up exercise maybe find a hobby, you know, what is, what is your support system look like? Maybe try to find yourself a good community. It's, Oh, here's a prescription. Right. Come back there's, in six months for a refill. Yeah. There's a drug for everything anymore. It seems. And unfortunately, yeah, I, th I see a lot of people, um, especially young people. I'm, I'm honestly frightened for my children's generation because they're, social media and cell phones and i sound like that old guy now um but i don't care i'm going to say it anyways um it's totally altered um i think people's ability to to deal with reality um to have normal social interaction skills because you know i don't i don't even think they can a lot of people can younger people can hold conversations with adults because they're not used to actually being face to face with somebody and interacting in that way. Um, and as we had, we had talked earlier, Trevor, I mean, nobody's typically posting their crap on their social media, you know, it's always the highlights. And so there's this pressure, um, to, to fit in and, and say, Hey, oh, yeah, my life's awesome too. 24 seven here. Look at me, take a snap of that, you know? Um, but life ain't perfect. Um, as anybody that's lived it knows. So you yeah, the, I, the, I think the video games are killing people, the porn, everything. Like I feel sorry for young people. They grew, because they grew up with the internet and stuff. I did not. So it's yeah. like, how can you not be addicted to video games and all that shit? He had the guy in, in Jacksonville over the weekend. I don't know if you guys heard about this. He lost the Madden video game. And he went to his car, got a gun, and, and came back and shot up everyone. Did you guys hear about that? He killed like five people, six people. Because he lost I, a video game. And he I killed didn't hear that that was the reason why. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it's a true story. It just boggles the mind. Like. Uh, uh, and you look at the kid's picture and he's the, uh, you know, perfect stereotype of the geeky video gamer, you yeah. know, and it's like, you know, it's just, um, it, it's just the perfect segue. So the stereotype is, 
is kind of, you know, correct on that. But, you know, these guys, um, like you said, they, they probably never even touched a girl, a real girl before. She, they probably just watched porn on their computer. So that if you put a real girl in front of them, they can't even get an erection. Yeah. And I'm not trying to, you know, be, you know, smart ass about it. It is really true. That's why you have 25 year olds taking an erectile dysfunction drug. I didn't even know what Viagra was at 25. And now every other 25 year old is taking Viagra. Obviously there is a pattern to why this is happening. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, I just wrote an article for elite FTS on identity. Um, and essentially the identity crisis that's going on right now, because, you know, as Trevor would probably agree with me, our identity is found in Jesus. It's who he says we are, not some made up identity that we create for ourselves. But when you wipe out God or Jesus and who he says that we are and our dignity and value and worth that's found in him, then we're left to create our own. And that's a huge amount of pressure in and of itself. That means you have to create your own identity and then you got to live up to it. And if you can't, it's an identity crisis. Um, I mean, I might not compete in bodybuilding again, to be honest, the way my life is right now. Um, I don't, I don't know that I will have time to get back on stage. Um, and I realized that probably six months ago and, um, I'm okay because there isn't, there isn't really anything left for me to accomplish on my bucket list. I've shot with all the photographers I've wanted to shoot with. I've been on the Olympia stage five times, I think. Um, I've won a pro contest. Um, I, there's not much left for me. Um, and my body's freaking jacked up mess. Um, and, and now I, you've been on the evolutionary radio podcast. Exactly. Exactly. Like this was the last checkbox. Um, no, but, you know, I even called John Meadows like six months ago because he has officially retired from competing. And I said, hey, man, I don't know if I'm going to compete again. Just reassure me that that life does go on. Right. And um, jokingly, but he was like, yeah, man, I feel like I got out of prison. Um, I can eat what I want when I want. And 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 it's not like he's getting fat. It's not like he's not working out. Um, but you know, competing in, in the IFBB, at least in, in the divisions I've been in, it's like always having homework. You know, I always feel like I should be eating more. I always feel like I should be training more. I, um, and so it's kind of a, a pressure that's now off my back because if I don't compete again, I don't compete again. And, and I'm training as hard as I ever have, but I'm actually enjoying it more because I'm not, I'm not doing it cause I have to, I'm just doing it cause I want to. I think all bodybuilders suffer from that type A personality where no matter how good you are, it's never good enough. Yeah. I remember watching an interview with Ronnie Coleman where someone asked him what his biggest regret was. He says, I wish I would have squatted 800 for three. <laughs> I don't know, man. He's a wreck right now. I don't know about that. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, right? It's like, I, I know exactly what you're saying is like, you're always can I do more cardio? Can I eat less? Could I've worked out more? Could I've, could I've done, you know, like this extra 1% here, this extra 1%, you're never satisfied. Right. Yeah. My question for you, Mark, is a lot of our listeners are aged 18 to 30. They're primarily males. Um, they're all, you know, athletes, weightlifters of some sort. A lot of them are looking up to you because, you know, you kind of have it all. You, you've got a beautiful wife. You're an IFBB pro. You've got a successful business. Why do you think you stayed on the straight and narrow this whole time and never got into video games, pornography, gambling, recreational drugs. Why do you think you strayed away from all those things when they're, they're all tempting? Um, that's a, that's a junk drawer full of a lot of things you just threw in there. So, um, I guess I, you know, in some ways I think bodybuilding actually helped me. Um, cause when I was, just getting into it, you know, I was partying on the weekends. And again, when I partied, it was alcohol. It wasn't snorting Coke or whatever people do today. Um, but I was like, this sucks. I, I don't like drinking and then going to lift weights. So I'm going to either just drink or I'm going to lift weights. 
and I picked lifting weights. Um, and so even though bodybuilding limits, I guess in some ways, um, your lifestyle because you have to, um, to rise to the, to the highest levels. Um, but it kept, it kept me focused, I guess. Um, I wasn't, um, I wasn't a model guy, um, in terms of fidelity before I met my wife. Um, I'm always thanking God that he gave me a hot wife because that helped. Um, but, um, I mean, ultimately I, I believe I'm going to give an account at the end of my life to my creator. Um, but at the same time, you know, living in begrudging submission to an angry God, um, is exhausting and most people can't endure it forever. Um, but that's bad theology. Um, we don't, we don't, we're not called into obedience to an angry God who's looking to, to punish us. He's a, he's a good father. Um, and a good father cares for his kids and he loves them. Um, and sometimes he disciplines them. Um, but only because he cares about them, just like I discipline my kids because I care about them. And I want their, I want a deeper joy for them than the, the surface pleasure of, of what teenage life has to offer them. Um, and so knowing that, um, and trying to pattern my life after, after the example of the person and the work of Jesus, um, as as, as crazy as that may sound, um, that's really the only thing I have to, to point to because I'm not, I'm not such a special guy that, um, that it was all me. I'm not taking credit for it. Sorry. <laughs> Mark, talk to us a little bit about your business. You're one of the few pro bodybuilders who doesn't, you know, personal train um, for a living, low off their endorsements, things like that. I mean, you do write for Elite TF. You do have a biotest sponsorship. Why did you keep your day job? Why didn't you try to make your bodybuilding a full-time gig? Well, for one, I knew um, bodybuilding's typically very short-lived. Um, I probably succeeded at it more, more so than most guys in terms of, my longevity. Um, but that was just partly a matter of putting my health before, uh, my bodybuilding goals. Um, and, um, yeah, I knew I needed, I needed something to pay the mortgage in case I blew a, blew a quad. Um, so bodybuilding was always just more of a supplement. Um, I was just blessed to actually get paid to do something that to some extent I would have done anyways. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I didn't stop, I haven't stopped working out um, and I'm not necessarily paid to work out. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I mean, I think very few people can live off of bodybuilding, Trevor. I mean, as you know, um, I suppose you could keep, you know, catapult into training people or whatnot. Um, but there's not a lot of money in sponsorships or even contests, you know, winning anymore. What exactly is your business, Mark? Fresh cut produce. Um, so we, we bring in truckloads. Um, 80% of our pounds is potatoes, onions, carrot, celery, um, we cut, wash, package, and, and sell it wholesale to food service distributors. So it ends up in schools or restaurants. Um, and then the other half of our business is ingredients um, to other food manufacturers. We sell to a division of Campbell's Soup um, and supply them with potatoes um, for their, um, I'm not sure what soup it goes into, loaded baked potato, I think. Um, but ingredients for, for some of the soup manufacturers and other food manufacturers. So we'll sell anything from a uh, one pound bag of kale to um, a 1,440 pound tote of, of diced potatoes. So it's pretty big spectrum. So there's no shortage of baked potatoes at your place? No. Um, although my wife 
uh, bugs me all the time because I don't ever bring home any any vegetables. Um, but but I could. I want to talk to you, Mark, about two things. So first, I wanted to ask you about hot yoga. I mean, I think you're the only pro bodybuilder doing hot yoga. I think it's super cool. But what got you into that? And then talk to us a little bit about your diet. I mean, I've seen some of your diet uh, posts on Elite FTS, and I mean you're doing the exact opposite of chicken and rice. I mean, you're eating like fermented foods. Um, you're kind of like intermittent fasting almost like a lot of times, like you're not really consuming a solid meal until after you've worked out or things like that. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, like your intro workout shakes, hot yoga. Where did, where did you get all these ideas? Um, hot yoga. The first time I did it, uh, we were filming one of my DVDs. I don't even remember what it was. Um, maybe, it was beyond driven or something was the title and my massage therapist um, did hot yoga and she was telling me about it and so we're like oh this will be funny let's let's go do hot yoga and film it um and so we we went in and did that and i remember the camera like filled with water from the humidity of everybody sweating um within like 15 minutes and we ruined the camera um, and I almost died because the instructor was like, oh, bodybuilder, let's put him under the heater and see how long he can last. Um, but I stuck it out like I was going to, I think I laid there for probably 20 minutes at the end of the, of the yoga session because I refused to let her win by walking out of the, of the studio. Um, but then I didn't do it for several years, but then, you know, I, I had a dry, a dry sauna and there's obviously health benefits to that. Um, I hate doing cardio. Um, and I also don't, I'm not a big believer in cardio, uh, for getting ready for, for competitions. And so, um, I was like, well, Hmm, hot yoga. That's like the equivalent of my sauna. I can also stretch. Um, it's good for my lower back, which is messed up. And so I can kind of kill all the birds with one stone, gets my heart rate up. I can skip doing, you know, any cardio. So I really kind of started doing it in prep for, for competitions. Um, but really just enjoy doing hot yoga. And so, yeah, I typically do it anywhere from two to three times a week. Um, that's how I got into that in terms of my nutrition. Um, I'm big into intra workout nutrition. Um, you mentioned BioTest. Um, I was with Nutrex for probably eight years of my bodybuilding career and um, ended up working with Tim Patterson, the owner of, of BioTest, um, when I was working with John Meadows in terms of him programming my workouts. And John wanted me to train six, seven days a week. And I was like, you know, at this point I was in my late thirties and I told John, I'm like, dude, I work out four days a week. Like that's the most I work out. Even when I was in my twenties, like I'm pushing 40 here, you're nuts. And, um, and so I couldn't recover. So he put me in touch with Tim. Tim started having me use plasma, which is his intra workout formula. Um, and literally within two weeks, I, I kid you not, like, um, my recovery skyrocketed. Um, to the point that I hardly got sore and I was working out seven days a week. Um, you, there was even a period of time when I told Tim, I'm like, Hey, put together a program. I want to see if I can train 12, 13, 14 times, you know, like twice a day. Can we do that? Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely sold on biotest. I, I left Nutrex, uh, for less money to go to biotest, um, and even at this point in my career, Biotest doesn't pay me um, anymore. Um, I still write for them on occasion, um, but I'm I'm still an avid believer believer in their product. I didn't, um, like I said, I went there simply because, you know, I wanted to be able to endorse something, not just because someone's given me a check, but because I actually use it and I believe in it and. Um, I literally hate working out without using plasma. I mean, I think it's that good. So pre-contest, off-season, doesn't matter. I use plasma um, and then supplement that with typically just whole food meals. And like you said, I'm not 
I'm not a big carb guy. I don't know if it's my, my mom's diabetic, so I don't know if that runs in my family, but, you know, talk to Branch Warren. He'll, he'll, he would eat a thousand grams of white rice. You know, I, I think about eating a hundred and my ankles start swelling with water. Um, so we're definitely different. Um, I did, I, I guess I probably shouldn't call it a ketogenic diet. Um, but very low carb diet. My protein was high, so I, I didn't really get into ketosis a whole lot. Um, but I dieted um, in that fashion based on reading about uh, Pasquale's anabolic solution diet um, back when I did the 2009 202 Olympia. I think I, I think I dieted for like eight weeks on 25 grams of carbs a day. Um, and was in the best shape of my life and I didn't lose muscle. Um, so there's, there's definitely more than one way of dieting. Um, and yeah, I tend to be a little more unconventional. Um, and it may be, you know, the whole fermented food thing. I'm big on that. Um, but I think, again, I think it might be just that I want to be around into my eighties at least. Um, so it wasn't always just about, what do I got to do to get that trophy? It's like, well, trophy would be nice, but I'd like to be healthy in the process. Do you get a lot of weird looks when doing yoga? Cause I mean, I'm, I'm like a 200 pound guy with abs and after the yoga class, a lot of people come up to me and they're like, bro, you're jacked. Like, how do I get muscles like you? You must, you must got like every person in the studio, like asking you for like workout advice or diet advice. Yeah. Some of the, some of the guys do afterward, but, I don't know, man. Yoga is like weird. It's like everyone's all in this meditative state. It's like I hardly even talk to anybody. Like everyone's like, be quiet. We're trying to get into our yoga mindset. I just like going. I just like going there and like seeing all the hot chicks and they're like um, underwear. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sweating next to them, and you get some like ugly ass fat guy old guy like next to you and he's like sweating all over the place and i'm like fucking dude you have to fucking come right next to me like of all these other fucking spaces you have to come right next to me that's so i usually wait till everyone is there and then go and put my mat down because i don't want to be next to some some, some you know some old you guy did, sweating you all didn't me. strike me as a yoga guy yourself so me was, yeah oh my god dude i'm living the hippie lifestyle i would love seattle yeah cute. dude i love like hairy women like hairy women <laughs> pussies and all that shit i'm into uh, the whole hippie hippie thing trust me <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's what seattle's known for no but seriously yeah i i do yoga like every day but Steve, uh he's a big yeah. hippie he's done a 19 day water fast the, the glasses he's wearing you might just think he's he's trying to be on star trek they're uh blue <laughs> Blue blockers, nice. I have a pair actually, but they don't look as cool as yours. Oh, okay, I wasn't sure if you were wearing them right now. Me? No. Yeah. They're not. They're not blue blockers. Okay. My my lighting is bad on the screen. So. But yeah. what's so? What's your plan, Mark, for the next five years? What are your goals? Uh, to see my daughters. Uh, to their wedding day. Hopefully with a guy that I like. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, let me yeah. think about that. My youngest just turned 16, so maybe a little more than five years for her. Um, although Christina and I, I was 22 and she was 21 when we got married. So we were, we just celebrated our 21st wedding anniversary last week. So I guess if my kids are on that trajectory, it could be within five years. Um, I mean, I'd like my business to be successful, um, obviously, um, not so much for my bank account, but just for the people that work for me. Um, I'm not really, you know, I take it serious, I guess, that there's 80 plus people that depend on my business to support their families and pay their bills. Um, and so, yeah, I would like to see that continue to grow. Um, yeah, I just, I hope my body holds together so I can just keep working out. Um, I doubt I'll be competing five years from now. Um, but I still intend to, to lift the weights and, and I don't want to get fat, you know, nobody <laughs> wants to get fat. <laughs> 
Well, they got they got like uh, seventy and over classes now at the nationals. Have you seen that? Are you serious? Yeah, there's. Uh, I don't know what it's called. I think it's like Grand Masters or something, and it's it's either sixty five and over or seventy and over. I've seen that at local NPC shows, but I didn't know they were doing it at nationals. Yeah. Hopefully they don't do that in the IFBB because I don't want to get lured back to the stage when I have no business putting a posing suit on. Well, didn't they, didn't they have, have one year have like an Olympia for the classics or something where it was like retired Olympia competitors? Yeah. And there were some of them you wish you hadn't seen, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, when Jay Cutler did his comeback, he got six. That's not bad. Yeah, but he wasn't like old and shriveled. Yeah, but age is a number, man. <laughs> well, I think I think he'll be back on stage one more time still. Maybe, maybe. I think so. Are your daughters currently dating anyone? Um, yes, two of them are. I want to know, as a father, how is that? Um, like, do you like yeah. their boyfriends? Yeah, I mean, I. I say that reluctantly because, because I really don't like any teenage boy um, <laughs> as I was one. Um, so I have a hard time like giving anyone approval, but, um, but they're both seem to be very respectful of my daughters. And ultimately um, that's what I would want for them is them to be with guys that respect them. Me and my girlfriend's uh, dad are, are total buddies. Like, we'll go golfing together. And then I formulate supplements for a living, so I'm always hooking him up with, like, free supplements. And he's okay. really, into, like, turmeric and things like that. And we're total buddies, and she hates it because I'll, like, be over for dinner, and I'll just be hanging out with her dad the whole time. And then someone will, will mention her. I'll be like, who's that? Oh, oh, yeah, her. Yeah. I mean, eventually um... – it seems like my life is so busy and even my oldest daughter's 19 um, and she works for a real estate company. And so she's, she's super busy. I hardly ever see her, but, um, but yeah, not having boys um, of my own in some ways it was like, Oh cool. There's, there's another male in the house that I can actually talk about football or whatever with. Um, so that part's cool. I think it's a little bit later. I think it's once, you know, your daughters will get in their mid twenties, then uh, yeah. you'll be able to actually like hang out with their boyfriends. Yeah. Cause I remember being, you know, in my early twenties, I, I wanted nothing to do with my girlfriend's parents. But then as you get older, you get like more serious and like, you actually want to like find a wife and not just a girlfriend. And then you want to get to know their family. Cause that's obviously important and things like that. Right. Right. Especially if they have money, you know, if they in laws, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> So we're coming up to the end of the show. I'll let Trevor finish up. But we like to do a little fun segment for your fans. Your fans always want to know more about you. So I'm going to throw five questions at you. And, you know, just shoot me back, you know, with your honest answer. So the first one is, what music is playing in your car right now when you're driving? The Killers. Okay. For real? Trevor, you know, Trevor, you know them, The Killers? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really hip. I'm impressed. Right. What's your favorite TV show? Favorite TV show. Oh, man. Something on Netflix. What was the last one we were hooked on? Stranger Things, I think. Yeah, a lot of people are into those Netflix uh, shows. Peaky Blinders. That was a good one. Okay. You wouldn't be successful in bodybuilding if it wasn't for who or what? Christina, my wife. Okay, that's a good answer. I'm putting you on a tropical island for two weeks. Give me two things you're taking with you. Hmm. My wife, obviously. Um, that's all I would need. You just need your wife? Okay. Why are you going to feed her? I don't know. We'll like coconuts or whatever. Okay. Right? <laughs> we don't even need clothes. Maybe it's... you need a screwdriver to get the coconuts open or a machete or something. Maybe that would yeah. be something. That'd be fun. You should do it. <laughs> Two weeks on an island. And the last question is one bodybuilder or fitness celebrity that you would want to have on your side in a bar fight. Who and why? 
Branch Warren. Um, Everyone says that. Yeah, I, it's because I've worked out with him, man. Oh, okay. He flips that switch, and holy crap, get out of that man's way. <laughs> so he's, he's pretty crazy, huh? Yeah. I mean, oh, that doesn't necessarily mean he can fight, but... Okay. <laughs> He'll scare people, though. But I don't think people will mess with him. Yeah, he's scary. <clears throat> My last question for you, Mark, is it seems like you've done everything right throughout your life. I mean, you've been very successful in bodybuilding, in your finances, in your relationships. Do you have you had like a life coach throughout all of this? Do you do any sort of like weird morning rituals, any morning hacks? Do you have anything like that? I mean, I don't. I read books. Um, my best life coach is my own dad. Um, he lives in Arizona, so I don't. I haven't. I don't see him often, but but I call him often. Um, I guess of anybody that I would need advice from that I would trust, it would be him. Where can our listeners get to, get to know you more? Do you have a website, Instagram, things like that? Yeah. Markdugdell.com, which is weird, right? Pretty soon nobody's going to have websites anymore. That's like, that's going to be like a cassette tape pretty soon. Um, but yeah, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Um, haven't quite made that transition to Snapchat yet. Um, but uh, yeah, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Are you pretty active on your social media accounts? Um, I mean, I am because I post my training uh, logs to Elite FTS. So I, I typically share that stuff um, on Facebook um, and Twitter and YouTube videos if I'm training. Um, but uh, Instagram, probably not, as mu- not, not that much. It's like I a full-time it. job now. I see people and they have like 50 updates to their story every day. I don't, I don't know how they do it. Dude, I don't either. I'm like, sometimes I'm looking at going, do these people work or what? Because <laughs> I, I, I think, think they have assistants or something. Yeah, that's true. There's, yeah. it's funny when I meet bodybuilders and they're like, they've got their social media person that, that posts all their content. Um, yeah, they just hire some PR person, pay him like thirty grand a year or something. Well, no, they, they ain't paying him thirty grand a year. Body, not that much. Geez. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot of them, Steve, are, are are like in school. They're in like uh, media school or graphic design school, and you have to do so many hours as like a practicum. So a lot of them aren't even actually paid. Yeah, they could be like interns and stuff. Yeah. I won't, I won't drop names, but one major media outlet just cycles through uh, interns every eight months and has never once paid the video editors. That's a good, that's a good business idea. For the record, I do pay my graphic designer. Um, I met him at church. He's a young kid who's in uh, graphic design school. Free supplements? No, I actually pay him money. Huh. I, uh, he, he does a lot for me, so I pretty much pay his, uh, his rent every year. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he's been a project, though, because he's in school, so he doesn't really know what I want. So, I mean, he'll send me something, and it'll just be, like, crap, and then I'll give him shit, and then he'll send me it again, and it'll be still crap, but a little bit better. And then uh, we – what was really bad is um, we had Boston Lloyd on the show, and he spelled his name wrong on the podcast artwork. And then, like, I posted it without looking, and then Boston – well, like, Boston's pretty chill, so he wasn't really mad, but he was like, hey, man, your, your graphic designer spelled my name wrong. And then, like, Josh was, like, really embarrassed and, like, wanted to call him to apologize. I was like, Josh, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. But it's, like, little things, like, when you're just, like, getting started, you wouldn't even, like, think to, like, spell check someone's name. You kind of right. just, oh, looks good. Next thing. Yeah. It's kind of like it's kind of like when you're sending an email to like a wholesaler, like you make sure to like read it back just to make sure there's no spelling mistakes or anything like that because it looks really bad if you made to, you wanted to say you know like price list attached and it says like price lip attached or something, it just right. makes you look like an idiot. Exactly. <laughs> okay, for your host Trevor Kritzen, for my co-host Steve Smee, and for our special guest IFBB Pro Mark Dugdale, it's been another episode of Evolutionary Radio. Live your life, look good doing it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>